He received his PhD from the University of Chicago, supervised by Chandra Zekar, a Nobel laureate. Presently, he's professor, emeritus professor at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, since 19, where he is at nine, since 1976. He was five years old at the time. <laughs> And most importantly, uh, Professor John Friedman is an international leader in relativistic astrophysics. And uh, we are very happy to have you, John. And today he, he's going to talk about a wonderful topic. He's quite involved, namely whispers from space, um, remarkable implications of the double neutron star merger, that one. <laughs> Thank you, John. Oh, all right. Well, that was the first thing I tried, but. <clears throat> Good. Uh, so let me just uh, put this. No, I'm, I'm okay. Let me just, uh, I got it. That's right. Good. Okay. Oh, not, not here. Uh, let's see. It's <laughs> back. Yeah, okay. Okay, sorry. You, do you use with the light? Do you use with the pointer? Yeah. If we have to be. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. So I want to talk about the implications of uh, this first observation of a double neutron star merger. GW 170817. Uh, the remarkable thing is that this was a simultaneous observation of gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves, that it was close enough to be seen electromagnetically. Uh, and the result of that led to resolution of a number of uh, outstanding problems, 50 year old questions in. Uh, astrophysics. The first one was uh, detection of gamma ray bursts in the late 60s when the United States put up a set of satellites to check for violations of the test ban treaty with the Soviet Union. They found gamma ray bursts, but they didn't come from uh, nuclear tests, of course. Uh, and there were about 100 different alternatives proposed, including relativistic BBs burning up in the solar system. Uh, here's an image of a gamma ray burst. And here's a continuous gamma ray spectrum in the disk of the Milky Way. So if the bursts had come from the Milky Way, they would be uh, similarly distributed in the disk in the sky in the Milky Way. Uh, and in fact, the distribution looked like this. They're distributed isotropically. That means that they are likely to be at cosmological distances, and that uh, inference was confirmed when a set of host galaxies were found uh, and identified with uh, the gamma ray bursts over the next uh, 30 years. So that implied, the redshift of these galaxies implied that the events were the most luminous, the brightest electromagnetically observed events in the universe, 
up to uh, 10 to the 54 ergs, or 1,000 times the energy emitted by the sun over its lifetime. There are two classes of the bursts. There are short bursts, less than a second, long bursts lasting be between, uh, well, you can see up to 100, up to, uh, up to 100 seconds there. Uh, yeah. And uh, there's a difference, a couple of other differences in these two classes of bursts. So the short bursts are typically shorter wavelengths. Uh, they come from galaxies where no new stars are being formed, whereas the long bursts all come from star-forming galaxies. So this is consistent with a model in which the long bursts are associated with the most luminous supernovae. So if you're in a star-forming galaxy, you always have young, massive stars that are forming. Massive stars evolve within 50 million years. They have a supernova. They end up as a neutron star or a black hole. Uh, in old galaxies, no new stars. You have nothing around that is unevolved and has a mass greater than the mass of the sun, nothing that can end up in a supernova. Uh, and the short bursts are associated with galaxies that have no young stars, no obvious galaxy at all, uh, and they're events with energies comparable to the energy of a collapse to a neutron star. So that fact made binary coalescence of dead stars the most plausible explanation for what you were looking at. Uh, so we can look. I want to do a series of calculations as we go along here. So this will be a back of the envelope introduction to gravitational wave astrophysics. The first of these is just to look at the radius of a neutron star, remind you how, what that, how that goes, and the energy of coalescence or the energy of collapse to a neutron star. So this is really a calculation done by Baden Zwicky a few years after the neutron was discovered in 1930. Uh, and underlie, underlies the Bodswicki proposal in 1934 that supernova represented the transition from an ordinary star to a neutron star. So radius of a neutron star, well, it's a star at or above nuclear density, uh, 2.3 times 10 to the 14 grams per cubic centimeter for, new, for saturation density, a mass typically 1.4 solar masses, the upper limit on the mass at which a collection of dead fermions, a collection of electrons that are cold, can sustain uh, a mass. If you have more than 1.4 solar masses, the electrons would have to go faster than light. So the upper limit on the speed at which particles can travel sets an upper limit on the pressure per unit density but there's no upper limit on the gravitational force per unit density, and that means that gravity overwhelms pressure, and the star collapses after the dead core of the star reaches about one and a half solar masses. Uh, so that's the mass of the neutron star that's left when it collapses, and the radius then is about 1.4 solar masses over uh, the density, and that gives 14 kilometers. Neutron stars are typically densities uh, above nuclear, reaching more than 10 to the 15 grams per cubic centimeter in the core, and the actual range of uh, density is somewhat higher than nuclear density, a radius between 9 and 14 kilometers. Uh, so there's neutron star coming down on us. Uh, so from that radius, we can figure out the energy of a supernova and the energy of a pair of neutron stars that collide. Uh, this is the binding energy of a neutron star on the order of m squared over r, uh, 1.4 solar masses. We'll take a typical radius of 11 kilometers, uh, corresponding to this somewhat higher than nuclear density, and we get 4 times 10 to the 43 ergs. So this is all, this is right in the right ballpark. 
energy of gamma ray bursts, 10 to the 50 to 10 to the 54 ergs in light neutrino and gravitational waves. Okay, so the energies look right. That's the prediction. And then 130 million years ago, uh, uh, in a galaxy far away, uh, here we are, a collision of a pair of neutron stars. So here's a, this is not an actual, let's see. Yeah. Not a, so the computer simulations are not quite up to this. Uh, you should watch this. They, as they spiral in, they go faster. What you hear is characteristic chirp. And then look. OK, so that's collimated magnetic field opening up a space where there are fewer baryons and a burst of gamma rays. So you can model the gamma ray burst. You can model the collimation of the field. You can't do this entire simulation. But uh, here's a, if you want to look later, there's uh, a GRMHD simulation that gets the collimated field and something of a, a suggested burst. All right, so uh, August 17th, 2017, uh, there was this chirp heard. Oh, you have a problem with sound? Uh -huh. Well, I don't know. Let's, let me just uh, check. I, I checked the sound earlier, but uh, I'm wondering if this. Let's, let's try it again. No. Oh, there. <laughs> ah, there it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, did you hear the real thing? Uh, yeah. So, so <laughs> All right. So we got you got the gravitational wave burst, and then the Fermi satellite. Uh, uh, a little less than two seconds later, detected the bing. That was the that was the bing you heard. That was the detection of a gamma ray burst two seconds afterwards. Gravitational waves matched the waveform for two neutron stars, each with mass approximately one and a half times the mass of the sun. Uh, from the glow hours after the collision, so 70 different observatories over the next 24 hours looked for a. Uh, a galaxy, it was identified, uh, and it's uh, NGC 4993 at a distance of 130 million light years. So immediately we can calculate the speed of gravitational waves. The time from the end of the gravitational wave chirp to the gamma ray burst is less than 1.8 seconds. Uh, burst was launched after merger, after the end of the chirp. And uh, so if gravity is slower than light, then the dis difference between the speed of light and the speed of a gravitational wave is less than 1.8 seconds over 130 million years, or 5 times 10 to the minus 16. Uh, so improving by uh, more than 10 orders of magnitude, the speed at which information about changes in the gravitational field propagates and giving the first measurement of the speed of a gravitational wave. Uh, if light is slower and emitted 
We assume conservatively up to 10 seconds. It's really emitted a couple of seconds after the burst. Then uh, velocity of gravitational waves minus the speed of light uh, is put in 10 seconds instead of 1.8, less than 3 times 10 to the minus 15. So incredibly strong constraints on the equivalence of the speed of gravitational waves and the speed of light. The next thing we turn to is nucleosynthesis. Uh, so let me remind you of what we were just talking about before. The most massive stars fuse element, elements up to iron in their cores. Uh, So there's silicon, an iron central core. They don't go beyond iron at thermal equilibrium. The binding energy per nucleon is a peak at the iron group, iron and nickel and isotopes of them. So in, ther in thermodynamic equilibrium, you, for you form no elements beyond iron. You're left with an iron core. Uh, and then the question arises, where do you get the elements heavier than the iron group? Uh, this was looked at by uh, a group of people pulled together by uh, Hoyle. So Fred Hoyle uh, wrote a key paper and then uh, contacted, Bur uh, contacted Fowler and they roped in uh, the Burbages. Uh, here's here they are. Uh, they elucidated pathways to the heavy elements, which we'll talk about. Uh, in the meantime, Fowler had, uh, meantime, Hoyle had written an intemperate letter and given some talks, uh, written a letter to the London Telegraph, uh, angrily denouncing the Nobel Committee for not giving a Nobel Prize to Jocelyn Bell, only honoring Tony Hewish for the discovery of uh, pulsars. Uh, so here's Fowler getting a Nobel Prize, talking to Queen Sylvia of Sweden, uh, not Hoyle. Uh, here's Martin Rees's comment on it. Simon Mitten uh, alluding to uh, Hoyle's complaints. So what did they talk about? You have to form these elements out of equilibrium. You form them by bombardment of lighter elements, starting with iron, uh, by neutrons. They didn't tell you where the neutrons were coming from, but they elucidated pathways that we'll talk about to get to these lighter elements. There are two classes of neutron bombardment processes. Bombardment that's faster than the decay time of the stuff you're forming, that's the rapid process uh, down here, and the slow process, slow bombardment, the time between captures longer than decay time. But in fact, the way these processes occur in reality, the S process, you have bombardment once every 10,000 or 100,000 years, the R process less than a second. So huge differences. Uh, neutrons produced in the cores of red giants late in their life, asymptotic branch stars, uh, by bombardment in the core of carbon and neon with alpha particles giving these reactions. So you get neutrons that fly out from the core. 100,000 years later, the next one, another 100,000 years, and 45 days later, iron decays. There's the beta decay, and you get cobalt with uh, 27 protons, so you've gone up from iron to cobalt. Uh, slow bombardment like this always keeps you in between these 100,000-year collisions with stable elements. Uh, so you move along what's called the valley of stability, the valley of the stable uh, isotopes, too many protons on the left side, Coulomb repulsion is too large, the energy is too high, and if you're on the right side, too many neutrons, the neutron Fermi energy is too high. So that leaves you in this valley, and you go up this valley of stability by successive neutron captures, followed by beta decays. 
in a zigzag along this pathway. But there's a problem with this if you just stick to the slow process, and that is that too many nuclei are unstable or have low binding energy, so it's difficult or impossible to reach them by slow bombardment. In particular, there's a set of large nuclei that have no stable nuclei around them. So an example is platinum with 120 neutrons. It's stable, but it's surrounded by this set of guys that are all unstable. So you can't bombard iridium over here and reach uh, platinum by going like that because all of, all of the iridium nuclei are going to decay. Uh, so they, these guys all decay in less than a day. You can't reach it. Uh, to get to platinum, the neutrons have to bombard the nuclei before they have a chance to decay. OK, decay stops, and now you have successive, uh, I mean, the bombardment stops. You have successive decays over here, 77 protons, 78 protons, and finally you reach platinum. OK, everybody happy with that? Uh, so your rapid decay produces extremely neutron-rich guys down here. Neutrons this way, protons going up like that. You produce a band of neutron-rich unstable nuclei, and they all decay upward to stability. And now you can reach a set of stable nuclei that you can't get to by the S process. Uh, the ones that you reach are determined in two ways. The abundances are determined. They're determined first by the uh, binding energy of these nuclei. And that gives you, so the magic, the nu neutron magic numbers where you have filled nuclear shells in the nucleus give you these peaks. First peak, second peak, third peak up here at, <coughs> So here's the lanthanides. Here's uh, you're peaking up here uh, above, you know, around gold and uh, platinum, lead, and then the second peak down here, just below the rare earths, and the first peak over here. Well, so the initial assumption was that supernova, for example, in this uh, simulation. Uh, here's the bombardment. You're forming that R band, and then you see the R band start to decay towards stability, and you get uh, an abundance that shows the three peaks. But to get to that, you need a second piece, and that is that you have to have uh, you have to have a variety of concentrations of neutrons. So if you have too high a concentration of neutrons, all the lower guys get bombarded and pushed up to the heaviest elements, and you get only the third peak. If you have too, too slow, too low a concentration of neutrons, which is what turns out to happen in supernovae, you don't reach the third peak. And you can only get the first and second peaks over here. You miss the lanthanides, and you miss the third peak. Uh, so that fact was only found out with more accurate uh, simulations of supernovae in the last uh, decade or so. So the air process elements, here they are built primarily or exclusively by rapid bombardment. You can see that you get that these are most of the heavy elements over here. So the rare earths, uh, all of these heavy transition metals, and uh, up to uranium down here. So rare earths, platinum, gold, uranium, so. <clears throat> OK, so what's the alternative? Well, already in 1974, Latimer and Schramm had suggested that you might get these guys from uh, ejected material in a collision of a black hole in a neutron star. And, fi and following the uh, discovery of the Pulse-Taylor pulsar and the uh, Taylor and Weisberg discovery of gravitational wave radiation reaction, the pulsar spiraling inward, uh, Symbolisti and Schramm suggested uh, 
collision of two neutron stars, and those are both the leading candidates for the R process uh, elements. So the calculation that they did that underlies this and that later people have done now is again a simple calculation we can go through. So here's the next back of an envelope calculation. The galactic mass of our process elements is 10 to the minus 7 times the mass of our galaxy, or about 10 to the 4, the mass of the galaxy in baryonic material, so about 10 to the 4 solar masses. And the question is, can neutron star and neutron star mergers produce all that? So that's the relevant calculation here, and that's part of what 1708-17 answered. So simulations of neutron star collisions before this and then afterwards uh, give 10 times the mass of the Earth in platinum and gold, 15,000 times the mass of the Earth in heavy elements, so about 10 to the minus 2 solar masses in heavy elements. So that's what you get from a single collision, and the question is, what's the rate of collisions? Well, the closest merger seen is the one that was seen with this gravitational, with the gravitational wave detection. So it was closer than any of the measured uh, gamma ray bursts that had been seen pr prior to that. Uh, so this was 40 megaparsecs, 130 million light years, as we talked about, uh, and that mean, and if we assume then that this is pretty typical. Once we reach the sensitivity, we saw a merger, so maybe you'll see one every two years. Maybe not, maybe it was lucky and we are only going to see one every 10 years, or maybe you're going to see one every half a year in general. We haven't seen anything since then, so that's, uh, but could be every half a year. So let's just take two years per merger within this distance. Uh, the volume within 40 megaparsecs is about three times 10 to the fifth cubic megaparsec. So what we're saying is that in every volume that large, you should see one merger every 10 years or so. Uh, just from this observation, uh, with incredible accuracy of one event. So that's our statistics. Uh, but we have a set of other gamma ray bursts which give you something not too far different. So with, say, two years per merger within this distance, the merger rate is then one for two years per three times 10 to the fifth cubic megaparsecs, or about four times 10 to the sixth per cubic megaparsec per year. Uh, and we want to know what the rate is per galaxy because we have, we know the mass per galaxy that we need, 10 to the four solar masses. And the rate per galaxy then comes from saying that there's about 100 cubic megaparsecs in the universe per star forming mass equivalent to that of the Milky Way. So you need 100 megaparsecs before you get a galaxy. Multiply this by 100 megaparsecs cubed per galaxy, and you get 4 times 10 to the minus 4 per Milky Way equivalent galaxy per year. Okay, so that's uh, an easy calculation, and this gives accuracy just as good as you get from the careful calculation. Uh, so the careful calculation gives 0.7 to 3 times 10 to the minus 4. Okay, so there we have it. Uh, galactic mass of our process elements, 10 to the 4 solar masses, our process mass per merger, well, greater than or equal to 10 to the minus 2 solar masses. This is from simulations, but we're about to do a calculation that will give this from tidal disruption. So the R process mass in the galaxy produced in the age of the universe, 10 to the minus 4 mergers per year is what we said, maybe a little more, 10 to the minus 2 solar masses per merger, maybe a little more than that, and 10 to the 10 years, and that gives you something more than 10 to the 4 solar masses. So it looks like we're in the ballpark. So this is, this is then the confirmation from uh, this one event that we get from neutron star mergers 
uh, a mass that's comparable to, uh, to this. So uncertainties in the amount per merger and a merger rate giving a range from seven times 10 to the minus three solar masses if the merger rate is significantly less than we estimated to something more than we can really accommodate. Okay, there's a prediction uh, that radio from this initial idea of producing our process elements from uh, mergers of neutron stars, and that says that after the merger, what do you have? Rapid bombardment leaves you all of these unstable elements, right? And those unstable elements are going to decay. You know the abundance of them. You know the decay rate. You know what wavelengths you should see and how long they should last. And that's what people looked for. That afterglow is called a kilonova. The glow was seen hours after the collision. Uh, here it is in the discovery image. So it should dim and get redder as time goes on. And that's what it's doing. And in fact, the question of whether you get the third peak in the lanthanides seems to have been answered in the last few months with uh, de detection of infrared light from the longest lived uh, radioactive decays. These are the lanthanides. And so you get a glow still uh, in infrared uh, a few months ago that uh, then seems to imply lanthanides in the our, our process and almost impossible to get lanthanides without getting the third peak. The third peak elements you can't uh, directly check yet. Okay, so because of this success, uh, you have this gold mine uh, in the sky and a bunch of uh, a bunch of enthusiastic headlines. So the third, the third thing that's partly resolved by uh, this single event uh, is a question of what the equation of state of neutrons looks like. The, what, what's the equation of state of matter above nuclear density at the highest densities found in the universe for cold matter? Uh, because neutron stars are cold, the equation of state is essentially the zero temperature equation of state. It depends only on density. So the lowest energy configuration uh, at z effectively zero temperature. So you have a single parameter pressure and energy density as a function of baryon mass density. Uh, and the questions that bedevil the equation of state is a question of how, essentially, how the quarks in the core of a neutron star group. Uh, so in particular, is the density high enough to push the Fermi energy of some down quarks above this threshold to convert to strange quarks? Uh, so converting a neutron uh, to a lambda particle takes an up quark, converts it to a down quark, and you convert then a proton to a lambda here in this uh, indirect way. So you have neutron proton going to proton lambda, uh, and so that's one possibility. Creating hyperons in the core, uh, so do the quarks group as hyperons? Do you get strange quarks? Is the density of the core high enough to dissolve the nucleons completely so you just have a single bag of free up, down, and strange quarks? And finally, uh, a still slightly open possibility is the true ground state of cold matter at zero temperature, just ordinary matter, once you get nuclei higher than several hundred baryons, really strange quark matter, uh, not iron. Uh, 
so are what we call neutron stars really strange quark stars, where the entire star is up, down, and strange quarks. So these are the possible alternatives shown here in this uh, diagram by Weber. <clears throat> Just up, down, and strange quarks in the core, the whole star, strange quark matter, hyperons, and then a possibility of condensates of pions and kaons. Uh, or you just have ordinary neutrons, protons, electrons, and then you always have high enough density to produce some muons from electrons being above the Fermi energy, uh, the Fermi energy of electrons being above the mass of muons. Uh, so there's a set of equations of state based on these different alternatives. Uh, here they all are. A feature of these equations of state is that when you plot log p versus log density, they look roughly linear for most of their segments, and you can approximate them by linear pieces in this log p versus log rho case. And then you can use your observations to uh, just fix the pressure at a few different densities, and we'll see that by doing that, you get a good accuracy for the equation of state. Well, it's about 3%. Uh, and the way it works uh, is related to uh, the <clears throat> way you figure this out is by looking at the one parameter family of neutron stars portrayed as a curve of mass versus radius. So this is what you observe, the mass and radius of a neutron star. That curve is determined by the equation of state. So you have a one parameter equation of state. You vary the central density of the uh, star, and you get a one parameter family of neutron stars based on the neutron star candidate equation of state. So here's central density rising. As you add baryons, uh, the radius of the star decreases. Then you reach your maximum mass. You're unstable past there. So each candidate equation of state gives you a different mass versus radius curve. And you can invert that to infer from the uh, the equation of state from measurements of mass and radius. In particular, if you measure neutron stars in binary systems, you're typically looking at stars around 1.4 solar masses, and you get uh, a radius of that star, and that gives you a density of about twice nuclear density. And if you measure the maximum mass of neutron stars, you're measuring neutron stars with the maximum possible central density, and that gives you the equation of state, gives you the pressure at about eight times nuclear density. So that's the, so those are the two key measurements. The radius of a neutron star, very difficult to measure. There's a bunch of optical observations, still uncertain by uh, maybe 20%, and the maximum mass. So currently, uh, well, we'll come back to it. If the equation of state of cold matter above nuclear density is soft, the star is centrally condensed, it looks small. If it, for a stiff equation of state, got a lot of pressure, keep the star apart, and you've got a less centrally condensed star with larger radius. So both of these things are measured in 1708-17 to different degrees of accuracy. The first part, the radius of a neutron star is measured by the effect of tides. So if you have a large neutron star, tides are going to be larger, you have a bigger effect, and we want to see how this thing goes. So with no tide, the distance between stars decreases at this rate that's determined by uh, energy loss to gravitational waves. So the energy of the orbit looks like minus m squared over uh, d, and then e dot over e looks like d dot over d if d is the distance between neutron stars. 
Uh, as D decreases, the height of the tide increases, and the tidal distortion of each star they stay pointing towards each other, and so, in effect, you've increased the quadrupole moment. So, what does that mean? The orbital energy now is being drained off in two ways. As D decreases, you're increasing the height of the tide, so you're doing work on the neutron star to distort it. So you got energy going into raising the tide on the neutron star, and then you've got a larger quadrupole moment. So you've got greater gravitational radiation coming from the increased quadrupole moment. So the net result is the orbit shrinks faster, frequency increases more quickly, tidal disruption ends the in-spiral sooner, the cutoff frequency is lower. Tides larger for large radii, so larger for stiffer equations of state, and you can see this in uh, Hodo Kazaka and the Masaru Shibata's group. Uh, here's a 14 kilometer neutron star pair. Uh, here, radius is only 13 kilometers, 12 kilometers, 11 kilometers. So that's the difference in what you see. That's what you're looking for. The end of the, the end of the in spiral, the tides are finally high enough to see the difference, and the and you get a coalescence significantly sooner, a few orbits sooner for 14 kilometers than 11 kilometers. But we're only looking at the effect in the last 10 orbits, and more strikingly in the last few orbits. Uh, so let's see how this goes. There's the there's a dependence of the neutron star deformability on radius, and it goes like radius to the fifth power. And this is the key calculation here. It determines so in doing this doing this calculation, uh, we find both the how you find the radius of the neutron star from the in spiral, but we also get the thing we were missing, the change in ma the mass that's ejected. So the R mode, the R process mass that you get out of a neutron star collision. So let's see how that goes. Uh, so the we define a deformability as uh, the thing that, so if E is the external quadrupole field, so the tidal field of your companion star, then it distorts this star, and the uh, coefficient in the distortion uh, relates. So the bigger the deformability, the bigger the quadrupole distortion for a given uh, tidal field. Oh, uh, yeah. What's that? The mass loss is negligible until it's tidally disrupted. And then, so in particular, if you have a black hole neutron star system, it's the tidal disruption at the end that goes into the disk around the neutron star and becomes the uh, our process elements. So that's, so as you say, there's no, until the tidal disruption at the end, there's no mass loss. All right, so we want to estimate the tidal imprint. We want to get the height of the tides. This is a calculation you may have done. Uh, and then the change in radiated power due to the increased quadrupole moment. Uh, and then we'll show that the energy to raise tides over the gravitational energy, uh, well, we'll say this, but show that the change in gravitational radiation from uh, change in quadrupole moments looks like r to the fifth over d to the fifth. So a high power of r, what you're measuring is the radius, uh, and a high power of d, r over d is small until the very end of the orbit, and it's because it's so small, this r over d to the fifth, that makes it so hard to measure. So height of the tide from conservation of energy in a rotating frame. Here's a spherical star before you turn on the tidal field turn on the tidal field, and in effect, if we, if we look at uh, uniform density star, we've got 
a little arc over here of the spherical star that's moved over here and raised by a heart height h, and it falls by a distance r in the tidal field of this star. So we want to figure out h by just saying that. You move the blue arcs to the position of the red arcs, each rises a distance h and falls in the tidal field by a distance r. Energy is conserved in the constant uh, time, constant field in a rotating frame. So the energy gained by rising a height h equals the energy lost by falling in a distance r. <coughs> Gravitational force of the parent star times h equals gravitational force of the tidal field times r. That's all there is. And so h is r to the fourth over d cubed. And the size of this arc, the tidally deformed mass, is the mass of the neutron star times r over d cubed. OK, so enhanced gravitational waves from large q. Delta Q looks like delta M times R. It's moved to distance R. Delta M times R squared. Delta Q over Q looks like delta M over M times R squared over D squared then. And uh, that, and delta M over M we just found was R cubed over D cubed. So this is R to the fifth over D to the fifth. That was our claim. Uh, and so delta E gravitational waves which looks like Q triple dot squared. So we have Q frequency, Q triple dot, Q frequency cubed. And then we square all of that. So we have Q delta Q times uh, omega to the sixth. And that gives us delta E gravitational waves over E gravitational waves looks like R to the fifth over D to the fifth. Are people happy with that? look a little bit glazed. Uh, so <laughs> we got E dot equals Q triple dot squared. So that <laughs> Q triple dot is equal to omega cubed Q. So this looks like omega to the sixth Q squared. And then delta E dot is omega to the sixth Q squared. Uh, well, let's, let's just write it as Q delta Q. Uh, so delta E dot over E dot is this R to the fifth over, is delta Q over Q, and that's R to the fifth over uh, D, to, D to the fifth. So that's the, that's the calculation. Measuring tidal deformability then is equivalent to measuring radius and the LIGO-Virgo analysis gives a probability density of an average value of lambda of the two stars deformability that corresponds to neutron star radius between 9 and 14 kilometers. So this is a first measurement. This is, this is not a real improvement over the, over the currently known range, but it's within the currently known range. And it has the advantage that it's essentially model independent. When you do optical observations of neutron stars to get their radius, you have to model the atmosphere and you have to model the interstellar medium between the star and us, and that leaves, leads to significant uncertainty. So as the sensitivity improves and the number of observations improve, we should be able to get this down in, uh, in the next several years to uh, uh, less than a kilometer in uh, uh, in uh, uncertainty. So from a bonus from this, the ejected mass is roughly delta M at a time near merger when it's tidally torn apart. Say D is, so when they're touching, D is 2R. So it has to be a little bit larger than 2R. In fact, it's around between 2 and 3, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I so we just assumed in doing this rough calculation uniform density. In fact, the equation of state means that if you have a soft equation of state, the star is more centrally condensed. 
So smaller stars uh, then have an even smaller change than this r to the fifth. So the actual dependence, because of the equation of state, which I was trying to suppress in the interest of time, is about r to the sixth. No, no, the equation of state is, it doesn't, the star doesn't significantly heat up. And as long as the star is cold, then the equation of state is just the equation, it's, the, it's locally determined. So in, in, any, in any little region of the star like this, you just look, at, you go into a co-moving frame, look at that matter, and that matter then is cold, and the density is a, pressure as a function of density, is just determined by the lowest energy state of cold matter. So, yeah. Yeah, so as soon as you get tidal disruption, then, then you significantly change the, the wave pattern and you rapidly go to, and then it rapidly completely disrupts and you, you reach peak wavelength and that's the end of the observed in spiral. So, so as soon as you start tidal, tidal disruption, then you significantly change the waveform. Right. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, Implications of post-merger observations. Uh, so we've talked about the change in radius. That's one of the two things, two key measurements related to the equation of state that you can make. The second is this one. This looks at the post-merger, uh, and this is a measurement that's already been done. In the future, the hope is to measure oscillations of the post-merger uh, neutron star before it collapses. Uh, but that's that's beyond uh, at the current. That's beyond the probably beyond the sensitivity of, adva of advanced LIGO. Might be possible. So largest neutron star masses that have been seen electromagnetically are of the order of two point of two solar masses. There's recently by Cromartie et al. Uh, there should be an R there. 2.14 plus. 2.14 solar masses, but the error bar is larger, 0.1. So this is really 2.04. That's uh, <coughs> that's over here. Uh, so these are the largest observed masses, uh, say about 2.1, let's say. Uh, but there's a stronger maximum mass, it turns out, from the post-merger observation. So. Uh, if you had prompt collapse, uh, mass above would be above the upper limit for a hot differentially rotating neutron star that you form in the collision. So rotation and heat sustain the neutron star above the maximum mass for a cold non-rotating star. Uh, but that's not what happened here. The collapse was delayed, delayed long enough to launch a gamma ray burst and delayed uh, somewhat beyond that. Uh, so that means that the maximum mass for a hot differential rotation is greater than the mass that you're left with of this remnant, and that uh, though then did collapse, so you didn't end up with a neutron star at the end, so your mass that you formed was greater than the maximum mass for uniform rotation. Uh, Oop, and uh, yeah. So that's your that's your constraints. All right. So maximum mass from post-merger observations: total mass greater than 2.73 solar masses from the LIGO observation. So the central uh, mass estimate is larger than this. This is the lower limit of the error bars. Mass of ejected material. 
well less than or of the order of 0.05 solar masses from a combination of electromagnetic observations and simulations by different groups. So this is model dependent, no prompt collapse. That's what we were just saying, max. So M max for hot differential rotation is greater than initial mass minus ejecta or 2.69 solar masses. Well, rotating stellar models, now you can accurately put that, write a stellar model uh, and compare it to, uh, so threshold mass for hot differentially rotating model uh, is, that's greater than 2.69 has a maximum spherical mass of greater than 2.15. So that's the, uh, that's the argument. Uh, and that then gives you, yep, keep putting this, that gives you uh, maximum spherical mass greater than 2.15 and uh, uh, and then uh, we have maximum M max for uniform rotation is 1.2 times M max spherical and uh, uh, and that gives you M max spherical less than uh, 2.73 solar masses over 1.2, which is 2.28 solar masses. So combined, we have the actual maximum spherical mass greater than 2.15 solar masses and less than 2.28 solar masses. Uh, okay, so we had so there's more stringent, uh, still more model dependent claims by various authors. Uh, a widely quoted thing by Margulit and Metzger find a maximum mass that's less than 2.17 times the mass of the sun, and again they rely on this argument that says that. Uh, uh, that the uh, initial remnant collapsed before differential rotation ended and it reached uniform rotation. So that means the maximum mass of the uniformly rotating cold star uh, is uh, this maximum mass, that's 1.2 times the spherical mass just from stellar models. Uh, so the actual spherical mass has to be less than that because uh, you got collapse. And so it has to be less than, than this thing. But the uh, we already had maximum mass less greater than 2.5. And so if you do this, uh, modeling of the ejecta, then they claim that you're between 2.5 and 2.17 instead of 2.28, but much more model dependent. But the punchline over here is that just from this observation, even with conservative assumptions, with little modeling, uh, you get a maximum mass that's above 2.15 solar masses and that is enough to rule out uh, most of these candidate equations of state. So you can see the, you can see over here 2.15 solar masses, and here is this set of candidate equations of state. Uh, so these guys are strange quark equations of state. Everything in gray has this has strange quark matter in the core or hyperons in the core. Very difficult now with 2.15 solar masses to have hyperons or strange quarks. It looks like we're really narrowing down with possibly a small region in the core to uh, a neutron star that's just uh, ordinary baryonic matter without strange quarks. Uh, okay increasingly unlikely pi on k on condensate. So the point here is that if you have, if you have strange quarks, if, you're, if they're accessible, you have a phase change. It's like 
trying to compress a gas when you have a phase change to condensing to water, you just press on it and you have this extra degree of freedom. The pressure doesn't increase with density, you just get more water. So you have this additional freedom available, a phase change available to you, and the pressure is lowered, the equation of state is softer, and you can't support 2.15 solar masses. That's what's happening. You can't have these extra degrees of freedom, you can't have a phase change to these other configurations and support that kind of mass. Okay, and the last calculation over here is uh, uh, the Hubble constant relates the, so there's a, a simple, oop. fairly simple calculation uh, that finishes this off. Hubble constant uh, relates the velocity of recession of a galaxy to the distance of the, of the galaxy. Uh, if you can identify the galaxy of an observed binary in spiral, you have the velocity from the galaxy's redshift, and that's what happened here, and you find the distance from the in spiral waveform. So this is a famous calculation, and it's, uh, it's easier than it's normally seen in the literature. So because of that, I just wanted to go through it at the end. So for quadrupole radiation, right, the frequency is twice the angular, the angular frequency of the neutron star binary system. Uh, e is the Newtonian energy of a binary, ma squared omega squared goes like omega to the three halves, so E dot over E by Kepler's law, and so E dot over E looks like omega to three halves times omega dot over omega. Anyway, it's proportional to a power of omega, and that's really all that's being used over here. Uh, so E dot over E is proportional to omega dot over omega. For quadrupole radiation, the amplitude, well, amplitude of quadrupole radiation is Q triple dot over the distance for the radiation. Dipole radiation is A dot over distance, Q, tri Q double dot, higher multiples, uh, more dots, and this looks like then ma squared omega squared over the distance, but a squared omega squared times m, this is really the reduced mass, is equal to the energy over the of the orbit over the distance. Okay, that's going to be all we need. <clears throat> the rate at which energy is radiated, this is h dot squared times d squared, that's your q triple dot squared, and that then is omega squared times h squared times d squared, so it's useful to write it in this form rather than q triple dot squared. So now what do we have? Omega dot over omega, that's proportional to e dot over e, and that's proportional, here's e dot, omega squared h squared d squared over e, but e looks like h times distance, right? h looked like e over d. That was our starting point, and so we get the distance in terms of the observables from the waveform, omega dot over omega cubed times h. That is it. All right. That, that is Hubble's, that is giving you the distance for Hubble's law, and all we needed was about four lines. Okay. With numerical constants kept, if you replace omega by the frequency measured in writing f over 100 hertz, you get distance is 780 times f dot over f cubed. This is omega dot over omega cubed times h measured in terms of 10 to the, strain measured in terms of 10 to the, well, 10 to the minus 23. The, the strain is, uh, the magnitude of the metric perturbation looks like 10 to the minus, is of order of 10 to the minus 23 by the time you get to the Earth. Okay, so that, that is the calculation. This is the result. Uh, here's H0 from GW7108.17. So the first detection away from design sensitivity, but already we have a nice curve that uh, matches these, uh, these two different ways of 
measuring H from uh, supernovae uh, in particular and from uh, cosmic microwave background radiation, which gives you this famous tension between the uh, outside the error bars at maybe three sigma, uh, between these two ways of measuring Hubble constant. And you can't resolve the difference yet, but again, uh, looks very tantalizing if we get, once we have a set of uh, 20, 40 mergers like this, uh, we should have, again, a model-independent way of measuring Hubble's constant to an accuracy good enough to resolve the discrepancy. OK, <laughs> you've seen all of these, now seen uh, six back-of-the-envelope calculations underlying everything we've gone over. Uh, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Questions? Yeah. Uh, con uh, thanks for the talk. And uh, I want to. I have a question about the collision. Uh, in your simulations, you they, they seem to be always in phase of rotation, like all, with the same the two neutron stars. Having all, always the you same face, the the, the, uh, the tides yes. pointing towards each other. Yeah. Uh, so if they are not rotating with relation to each other, wouldn't that tides be out of phase? Mm -hmm. Right. Does so that make any difference? It would, uh, but the so the point here is that it, the material itself is not, even though I calculated it by moving this you know, talking about moving this arc over to get an equivalent way of calculating the height of the tide. The, all that happens is that, so the neutron, the, the stars don't co-rotate. Uh, the stars themselves are, are nearly, are rotating much more slowly and not in, in, in a direction correlated with the orbital frequency in general. So you have a tidal bulge, but it, and it always, it's just always along the line because there's negligible. So in the Earth's tides, you have this phase difference. And it comes from dissipation, well, from the fact that there are continents. And the tides are the water, and it has to contend with the continents. Here, all you're doing is, so if you, if you had a spherical Earth with uh, with no continents under the ocean, just covered uniformly by water, then, and the water were frictionless, so there was no dissipation, then the tide would always face the moon. So that's essentially the situation you're looking at here. There's, the, the stuff isn't moving around the surface, it's just being slightly distorted as, as it goes along, and the part that's being distorted is always along the line. Uh, so you don't have this phase lag, and, and that doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. So do you believe these gravitational sirens will solve the tension, the Hubble constant in favor of the CMB or the supernova? <laughs> 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 I don't have a clue. <laughs> of those equations of state which were not ruled out yet, uh, can we learn something about this nuclear matter above nuclear density? I mean, is there any of those equations of state which were not uh, which were not ruled out yet? Are some of them exotic material or something uh, like that? Well, no, so that's the point. The, the guys that are, you can't, theorists are always inventive. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what the, that's what you got paid for. And if, <laughs> so there will always be equation of state models that have hyperons or, or strange quarks. 
But uh, so you can't say they're ruled out in the same way you can't absolutely rule out alternatives to you know, you know Einstein's theory. You have some level at which so they become increasingly Im Im improbable. Uh, but the in in what I was showing you these. From the older equations of state, before you had to worry, before you had to contend with observation, uh, all of the guys that had hyperons and strange quarks failed. Uh, so it, it's so what you're left with is uh, neutrons and protons, uh, but you you still learn something. You still learn for, for there's still a variety of equations of state for neutrons and protons. So you learn uh, what the pressure is at about eight times nuclear density, and that really, that and then you, if you get a good radius, so over the next four or five years we should get a good radius uh, at 1.4 solar masses or so, and that looks to be pretty small, and then causality makes it hard to get the so you're you're really causality itself is tightly constraining. The equation of state between 1.4 solar masses and uh, and 2.17 or 2.2, whatever the actual mac maximum mass is. Uh, so I yeah. think I think we're going to have a really tightly constrained equation of state over the next decade. Yeah. When I'm when I when I meant well, when I said yeah. exotic matters, I mean not not so exotic as these ones, but no. I mean also there are some some equations of state which not so exotic matter, which were also ruled out, right? So those, those ones which survive, they probably differ from you just by details, right? So that's my question, actually. So what, ca what could we learn from those which survive about this nuclear density, which even, um, even among those models with just regular matter, protons and neutrons, so what are those which were discarded how they yeah, differ. So well, I, I I suppose you you know you have a, so it implies more repulsion at high densities. So there are there are constants, a set of constants characterizing the equation of state uh, that give you coupling between uh, you know exchanged particles. So exchanged rows, exchanged pi, pi's, exchanged omegas, and the couplings for uh, for these at high densities seem to be too difficult to calculate using many body theory. So it should be uh, it should be giving you constraints on those uh, on those parameters in in your Lagrangian. Yeah. Me? It's me. Oh, thank you. Um, so I, mean, I have two questions actually. So my first question is, you mentioned in the beginning of your talk about some the presence of a strong magnetic field so in the, uh, in the neutral stars. Do you know anything about the origin of this magnetic field? Yeah. Uh, so that, so there have been, the last decade has had a bunch of simulations of the early merger and wind up of the magnetic field. So there's a couple. So. In the merger, you have you've got large differential rotation, uh, and any time you have large differential rotation with the with uh, a mag with a seed field with a seed magnetic field that's small, it can be small, but uh, then there's a couple of different instabilities. There's a magneto rotational instability, a Taylor instability, uh, and these. Uh, Build up the magnetic field, which then wind, is wound up by the differential rotation. So you end up with, uh, over a short time scale, high differential rotation gives you a large magnetic field, and that's what, and essentially independent of the seed field you start with, it looks like. So that's pretty well understood. The simulations still have some difficulty. You. To the instability operates on short wave on short distances, short wavelengths. So you have to have very high resolution to uh, resolve the growth of the 
MRI or the Taylor instability. Uh, and uh, so people are still struggling to get agreement between different groups and get a consistent picture uh, of, but there isn't any question that you get this growing, large growth in the magnetic field from the instability uh, after, from the instability and then differential rotation wind up uh, after coalescence. Wait, uh, my second question is just a curiosity, actually, because it was not clear for me how people know that neutron stars is cold. Okay, uh, so the question, so what cold means is that the uh, temperature of the neutron star is small. So KT is is small compared to the uh, binding energy per baryon. So the, ener the energy, per the Fermi energy of, of neutrons and protons is, is very large compared to KT. That's the same criteria for saying when a metal is cold. So the electrons in the metal have, uh, have a temperature small compared to uh, the Fermi, their Fermi level in the metal. Uh, people get these insights from the observation, right? Uh, from the temperature you get from observation, you get you can you can get the you can see the temperature of uh, of accreting neutron stars. You can limit the temperature of old neutron stars from uh, from the light from the light or lack of it emitted by the star. And then and then there are just theoretical cooling curves for neutron stars. So it's a combination of observation and theoretical cooling. Uh, Friedman, uh, suppose that uh, the mass loss before imaging uh, has been somewhat uh, subestimated, underestimated. Uh, so in this way, what what kind of sign should be expected in the gravitational wave, uh, in, in the in the measured sign? Uh, yeah, you you would expect so you expect a still more rapid uh, increase in frequency, uh, more, and you'd expect the merger to occur at higher than expect at a frequency that was uh, higher than expected. So you you have a faster transition, but then you, you, your stars are farther apart. I, I said higher, I meant lower. Stars are farther apart when, they, when they're tidally disrupted, and then the wave signal suddenly drops in amplitude when the stars are farther apart, so peak frequency is lower. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so you'd get an unexpected, Two unexpected things, lower frequency and more rapid decrease to that frequency. OK, I, I have a, a, a second question. It's related, it's related with the measurement of, of the H0 using this event. Yeah. Uh, uh, it seems that, uh, uh, it seems that the larger values of H0 are favored by this by this event, no? The oh, larger larger values of oh, uh, I see. You you were you were not looking at the yeah, derivation. Yeah, it seems that this. larger values uh, are are preferred by this event, and the, mm. uh, in this way, it is more in agreement with the local measurements of of uh, of the Hubble constant. But mm. do you have some some guess? about uh, the future, when you have uh, 50 events, uh, do you think that uh, uh, the local measurements or CMB measurements uh, may be right? Do you have some guess about that? Do you have some discussion about that? <laughs> I haven't learned anything since the last time this question was asked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so about the H0 measurements, uh, is there a prediction on how many years uh, we'll have the number of events required for a narrower bar that is competitive with Planck and Rias measurements? Uh, can you say that again? Uh, how many years of, of measures will have an error bar on? Oh, I, a gravitational wave error bar that's, that's yeah. smaller than smaller than. Or these. compared to. Well, yeah. So that 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 depends on this event rate, right? You you need you're going to need of of order fifty. So sensitivity will increase. Uh, so that means you can get sensitivity like this uh, at a higher event rate than we have now. But uh, the and but I think the key thing is that with increased sensitivity, you should get uh, better signal to noise. You you get a better you get a narrower uh, error bar for each event, and then you can add up the events. So I think so. This, you have to have events that are close. So the increased sensitivity won't increase the event rate. All it'll do is decrease the size of the error bar per event, and then you, you're going to need these 40 to 50 events to get down to start making this resolution. So you've seen the giant error bars in still what you know five years ago before. Any of these detections, the error bars and the event rates were factors of a thousand. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now they're down to a factor of ten. So, so will we have? So, you know, we could have 40, 40 events like this uh, in ten years, or maybe it'll take. You know, maybe not. Maybe you're only getting one event like this in in five years, and then. <laughs> And it's going to be a long time before this uh, before this this happens. But uh, but you know, with as the sensitivity by the time you know sensitivity should keep improving. So if we're talking about a decade, then you can start looking at more distant events, and then you have a much higher event rate, and then you can add up add up the results from more distant events. And so I don't think, you know, we're not talking about 50 years to do this, but maybe we're talking about 10 or 15. Yeah. Happily, you are young. You can wait. Um, it seems that there are, there are a lot other candidates for this kind of mergers uh, since this first one. And uh, some of them actually were, I don't know if as good as this one, but some of them were actually, they seem to be classified at the time as merger of neutron stars, but none of them were actually uh, uh, detected by Fermi, right? Right, so and they were... when you calculate those distances of those events, is, it, is this, I mean, is completely consistent with the fact that Fermi didn't detect it? Uh, I think so. These... So one thing I did among the large number of things that were suppressed here to get the in in this in this talk, uh, although you saw it, you confirmed the fact that you got a gamma ray burst from neutron star neutron star coalescence. It was not your typical gamma ray burst. So if this if this had been if this had been out at 200 megaparsecs, then Fermi would not have. It was seen because it was close. If it was out, you know, some of these are 600 megaparsecs away for these possible you know, things that are not clear detections that might be detected. This is the closest one. And, this was the closest one. And this one. is by far the closest. So I think there isn't a kind of, so to finish what I was initially saying, the, the, this was not a typical event. The, it, what you normally see when you see a burst is an on-axis burst, you have to, it has to be pointing at you within a cone of maybe 20 degrees for you to see it. Otherwise, it's invisible. So most of the gamma ray events that occur, you don't see. 
so that's why if you take this event and put it farther out and have a random orientation, you don't see it. If you put it farther out and you were lucky and it was pointing towards you, okay, then you, then you could still see it. But this event looked not only like it wasn't pointing at you, but that the uh, stuff going out in the burst was partially choked. So there might be a whole class of gamma of things like this that you just haven't seen or rarely seen in Fermi because they're they're choked, uh, they're partly choked uh, bursts, and the stuff doesn't quite make it out from the debris. Other questions? No? So then I think that's time to finish with this wonderful uh, slide about the universe. That's a good point to finish. We thank you again, all you lecturers. Thank you very much. Thank you all the audience who came here to, to the workshop and hope to see you soon here at uh, IFT. And let's thank George and... Yeah. Well, and, let's thank Nathan. And, Nathan. And Nathan. <laughs> Thank you.